here in section 5.3, we're, we're going to focus on is the fact of the definite in integral. The indefinite integral is the one that we just usually added kind of plus c to it. We just took the integration, then we added a plus c. Well, the definite integral is specifically when we're looking at finding the integral over a specific closed region, like from a to b. So if you look at our notation right here on the left, you see normally we see the integral sign just as is, but all of a sudden we add these values a to b. So it's be like looking in our example saying, oh, let's find the Riemann sum from over the interval from 0 to 1 for this function, or the Riemann sum over the interval from negative pi to pi. Remember doing that? Well, that's what we're going to add. The actual definite integral means we're going to get a definite answer. Okay, it's not going to be just a function. It's going to be an actual answer coming out like 1, negative 14, stuff like that. Okay? Um, kind of looking through all of these. These are just general notes. Hopefully you all have all read them. I really want to focus more on theorem number 2. Theorem number 2 is where we have some properties. So if I do an integration from B to A, and I want to swap it around and go from A to B, all I've got to do is attach a minus sign out front. That's all it's saying. The integral from a to a, so when we have the exact same value, it's going to equal zero no matter what. Because remember, integral, what it does is it's finding the area under a curve. And if you go from a to a, you don't really have a curve, you have a point. And the integral or the area for a point is always going to be zero. Okay? If you've got a constant attached to your function, obviously you can factor that constant out throughout it, just kind of like what we can do with derivatives. And kind of looking through these, y'all are kind of familiar with a, probably a bunch of them. They make sense. Look at number six. I want to kind of point out number six is that if a function has a max value and also has a minimum value, then the maximum value times the interval is going to be smaller than the overall area, which is then going to be smaller than the max value times the interval. Okay? So it's almost kind of like the min value, the y value times the x, which is like the whole distance between a and b. It's going to be smaller than the whole entire area times the largest value over that. So it's just kind of an interesting thought to keep in mind as we go throughout some of these problems. And last but number, not least, but number seven, is it says if you have a function that's larger than another function over the specific interval, then its area under the curve of that first function that's larger has got to be large, it's going to be larger than the area under the curve for the second one. That kind of makes sense. I mean, you think about it. If this is a and this is b, and you've got f of x coming up here, and then let's say you have g of x doing this, you know, the area under the curve for all of f of x obviously is a lot more when g of x, all it does is just do this, you know, it kind of makes sense for you. Okay, and one more point I want to look at too as well, is the whole idea, it's basically what we've been saying, that to find the area under the curve of any function from a to b, all it is is finding the definite integral from a to b for that function. Okay? And whenever we consider the area under the curve, we always consider it as being from the curve to the x-axis. We don't go past the x-axis. Now if part of the graph is considered is actually goes below it during that interval that you're looking to do, then we consider the part above the x-axis as positive and the area below at the negative area. Okay. And lastly, because we're going to use this definition here in just a second. But the average value over a closed interval a to b is also known as the mean. It's just going to be the average value of the function. It's just 1 over basically the length of the interval times the definite integral. Okay, well let's look here at example 1 and get started. We have some values that they've given us. We know for a fact that between 1 and 9, the area is going to be negative 1. Between 7 and 9, the area under the curve is 5. And between 7 and 9 of another function, h of x, is going to be 4. So we want to find the following. For part a, if we want to use our rules, it basically says we can break this up. We can take the integral from 7 to 9 of f of x dx, and then add on the integral from 7 to 9 of h of x dx. Okay. Well, the integral of f of x dx from 7 to 9 is 5 of h of x over that same region is going to be 4, so we have an overall answer of 9. Looking at this next one, knowing that I can pull a constant out, that's going to be 2 times the integral from 7 to 9 of f of x dx, minus 3 times the integral from 7 to 9 of h of x dx. Okay, So that's going to be 2 times 5 
minus 3 times 4. So we'll get an overall answer of negative 2. Okay, doing some more in our property. We want to find, we want to basically find the definite integral from 1 to 7 of f of x dx. Well, we know the integral from 1 to 9 of f of x, and then we know from 7 to 9, so how do we get just from 1 to 7? Obviously, if I take the integral from 1 to 9 of f of x dx, and then subtract the integral from 7 to 9 of f of x dx, then that should leave us with exactly the inter integral we need, just going from 1 to 7. So 1 to 9 is negative 1, and then minus 7 to 9 is 5, so together then it's going to be a negative 6. Okay, right here, 9 to 7. Again, all of our derivatives, or all of our integrals up there, are all from 7 to 9, not 9 to 7. So if we swap this around and say, okay, this is the same thing as asking us from 7 to 9 of h of x minus f of x dx, because I swapped the integrals, or basically the, the values right there, I've got to put a minus out front. Okay. So this is going to be the same thing. I'm going to run out of room of it. As the negative integral from 7 to 9 of h of x dx minus a negative, so plus the integral from 7 to 9 of h of x dx. Okay, filling this in. So this will be negative. 7 to 9 of h of x is 4, plus 7 to 9 of f of x. I'm sorry, that last one should be f of x. I was like, I didn't think there was two of the same one, but... Okay, 7 to 9 of f of x, which is 5, so a grand total of 1. All right, so example 2, in order to practice some of our rules even further, we want to find the integral from 1 to 3, the definite integral, of h of r dr. Okay, we know it from negative 1 to 1, and we know it from negative 1 to 3. So in order to get it just from 1 to 3, it looks like I need to start out with the large one, going from negative 1 to 3. And then I'm going to have to subtract from that part the little part that just goes from negative 1 to 1. Okay. So it's like, if you think of the number line, here's negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. I know from negative 1 to 3, I know from negative 1 to 1, so if I take and I subtract that out, what's going to be left is just this 1 to 3, which they're asking us for. Okay, so the integral from negative 1 to 3 is 6, integral from negative 1 to 1 is 0, so an overall answer of 6. Okay, and here with part B, I know that they want me to find the integral from 3 to 1. Well, I just found it from 1 to 3, so if I just want to swap those around, then all I have to do is obviously put a double negative out front, because it was negative, and then when I swapped it around, I, you need to put another negative out front, which makes it positive. Okay, and then finishing this out, we notice that the exact same integral at this point now of part A which we already did their answer for, so we're going to get an answer to be 6. Okay. Example 3. We want to use the graph of the integrand, so the integrand itself is this part that's this function sitting right there inside the parentheses, to find the area for that, that, for that graph. Okay. So let me draw the graph for you guys. Okay, well looking at this graph, you will see that basically all it is is Obviously, the square root graph, which is your v, flipped upside down and then shifted up one. Okay, and specifically over the inter the interval from negative one to one. So if we look at this left portion right here. It's almost got its own little function. That's going to be y is equal to x plus one. And then if we look at this left portion right here, it's y equals negative x plus one. Okay. So when we want to go and find the area under this whole entire curve right here. We have to divide it up almost into two parts because we have two different graphs for each one. The first one, which is going to go from negative 1 to 0, the function there is x plus 1. Okay, And then we got to add on the area under the other curve, which is going to go from 0 to 1, 
and that function right there is negative x plus 1. And that's going to find the total area. Okay, so now let's look at this. We want to find the area under the curve from negative 1, 0 of x plus 1. Okay, well at this point we really don't know how to evaluate what's on the left and what's on this right side of this equation. We know how to take the integral, the, the indefinite integral of like x plus 1 and negative x plus 1, but as far as evaluating them from 0 to 1, that's all going to be in the next section, negative 1 to 0. So what I'm going to do, I'm wanting to lead that up and kind of give you guys the foundations. We're going to come right to this in the next section, so it's good to see this. But let's look over here. We basically have a triangle, right? Well, can we find the area of a triangle? Let's change that. Area of a triangle is 1 half the base times the height. Well, the base itself, one unit there, one unit there, so 2. The height is 1, so the area, all in all, we're going to call it 1 unit squared. And it's as simple as that. But again, I just wanted to show you guys that because we're about to use that here in just the next lesson.